Good evening, replay viewers. It's Melissa Ledger Gumball Love. Thanks so much for joining on this late Friday night. I hope you are doing great and having a great start to the new year. So I'm going to flip the camera. Hey, everybody. It's Melissa Ledger. Let me get this set up really quick. So how's everybody doing? I just wanted to chat with you guys for a little bit about when you're in this dilemma, let me shut the music down a little bit. And I don't know how many will join us, but I know the right people will be in the room. I know it's late. Hello, my fellow night owls. Is anyone, are you guys night owls or are you on the West Coast? If you are a night owl, type in owl. I am a night owl. I would, I fight it. Actually, I don't know. Do I really fight it? Because it's 1135. I'm not really fighting it. You're a night owl. CMOS, of course, my sister. Hey, Tammy, Christy, yes, you are. Uh, I, I didn't know you were in Washington, Christy. I, didn't, I guess I didn't know that. Uh, so welcome, you guys. And I, this isn't going to be super structured. I'm just writing a lot and working a lot. I'm writing still, yes, always, always, always writing. And sometimes you get to a point in when you're writing and basically, I have this completed book without a lot of my stories in it. And so I'm putting myself into my book, which is really hard. And that's what caused a major delay. The editor was like, you know, Melissa, this is great, but you're not in the book. <laughs> and so I always thought, well, wouldn't it be boring if my stories were in the book? And they were like, uh, no, you need to put yourself in the book. And so I'm incorporating those stories. And then what prompted this scope is that one of, I started with my first love and I started with, um, so we want to hear about you and your, thank you. I appreciate that. It have to make, yes, Christy, you're right. You have to make yourself vulnerable and making myself, thank you, James Brown for inviting followers. You have to make yourself vulnerable and it's really hard to do, but I will say doing Periscope Real, thank you guys so much for inviting followers. Doing Periscope really helps you as a writer. So if you're considering writing and you have a topic, Periscope helped me immensely because you get a feel for what people are going to say and are they going to judge me? And y even some of the haters show up, but it's it's like almost like you welcome the haters, not that you want them, but you kind of get a feel for what they're going to say. Hey, Kara Tibbles, thank you so much for sharing and inviting followers. And so... I think every single, no judge zone, thank you. I think every single one of us has gone through this where you feel like somebody, hey, Shanice, you feel like the person is too good to leave or too bad to stay, but too good to leave. There's even a book, um, here it is. There's a book that has this title. So if you were thinking about writing that book, it's already been done. But I, I really like this book because it kind of helps you or it goes back and forth. It does get really detailed into a lot of different people's stories. See, and I hate that. I hate when it gets, <laughs> there goes your idea. I know, right? I hate when stories get too in-depth. So my book will not get so in-depth that you're like, dude, I don't care about that much of your story. You know, uh, those are the relationships you wasted. Well, I did too. I wasted a ton of time. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Melissa Ledger. I created this concept called Gumball Love. And Gumball Love is what I discovered is the love of attention. And some people will say, is that narcissism? And I say yes and no. Sometimes people are definitely narcissists and other times they really just like attention, but that addiction to the attention, I don't think all the time is narcissism. And so that is the whole purpose of the book. So in this process, uh, I have kept, I only have letters and paraphernalia. Uh, really, girl, you can't afford this. I can't afford what? Sorry. Are you the same person that asked me if I loved you? I do. I totally paraphernalia. Yes, I have relationship paraphernalia with from one relationship and it was my first love and I think he would die if he knew I still had all this stuff. But I do and I'll show you. And and I've read through it. Here it is. Here's my box. The the card that said congratulations on your engagement, the journal that went through all the stuff, pictures, tons of letters. All of these are love letters. And look at all these. Tons. 
tons and tons. So this was my first love. And I kept this because I knew for a long time, I kept it in a box for, or kept it in the storage forever. And then when I started writing, my first love was when I was 18. So it was from 18 to 20 years old. And I got engaged when I was 20. I thought I was so old and ready and mature, like whatever. You're trying to invite your friend Christina. You're going to get her. Uh, try, okay, yes, yeah, get Christina. and She can watch the replay. And I kept all this because I wanted to see what was it about him that tempted me back then? Because knowing him today, no offense if anyone knows him, but he would not tempt me today. However, back then, he was a big deal. And I think it's important to go back in your relationship history and really look at the people that made you fall for them. Like what, what was the first experience like for you that made you so into that person. Hey, Hillary. Hillary, who is, we just talked on the phone. She's going to bed. She's saying hi and goodbye. Um, so she's not a night owl like we are. Okay, so what we're talking about is your first love and, or maybe it was the first person. <laughs> Good night, Hillary. It was that first person. Really what I wanted to ask you guys is, what did your first love do that made you go crazy for them? Think about it. And it might take you, you may not even have enough, you may have to like reflect. You may not even be able to type it in or if you can, type it in and, and think about what it was. Because as I look through all of the letters that I, all the letters, it was all schmoofy, schmoofy, lovey-dovey stuff, right? And it wasn't real. <sighs> okay. I look at it and I'm like, this wasn't real love. Although I knew I was in love tonight. I know so many trolls. It's okay. I'm used to it. I see my beautiful friends get called fat and ugly. So it's like, you know, it never feels good hearing it, but you know, it pretty much, I do pretty much forget it the night of the, um, yo, okay. I'm not sure what that comment means, but be careful. You just about got blocked. Um, and some people, I don't even know if it's worth blocking them because will they ever come back? You know, who knows? Anyway, <laughs> it means you look good. Good. I'm glad that means, thank you. I appreciate it. The one true, what is your first name? Um, so, of course, the trolls, it means you're hot. Yes. Alan. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate that. So, um, so no one has thoughts. What, is, what did your first love do? Okay. So, first, one of my love languages is words of affirmation. He was clingy and, and possessive and I mistook it for love. Okay. Very good. When I look back at this first love, and you guys tell me if this is boring or not, but when I look back at this first love, he was in a really bad place. He was, he, he was captain of the football team, had the baseball scholarship, was super cute. I mean, dimples and blue eyes and dark hair. And he was my best friend's older brother who I'd go spend the night at her house and we would giggle when he would like go from the upstairs shower downstairs. And, um, I'm sorry. I had to just, that person's irritating me. Um, did I want, do you, did you want me to help him out? I don't know. Woof now. though. <laughs> okay. So we're not going to pick on him now, but he was like the bomb back then. Okay. But he was, he was four years older than me. So he was even more like, oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, I said he was in a bad place. Yes, he was in a bad place back then because he had graduated from high school. He was four years ahead of me. I don't really remember from when I was in high school, like what, what he was doing when I was in high school. I don't know. I think he was in college and doing other things. Like it's not important. But when, uh, when we met, it was like, we met at our little hometown carnival. It's like a freaking Hallmark movie waiting to happen. We met at our hometown carnival. Of course, we'd known each other our whole lives. But when that we met at that carnival at the beer garden, it was like fate, right? 
so stupid. I just like literally roll my eyes now. But at the time I was like, oh my gosh, he is talking to me. He's into me. Um, how romantical it was. It was very, it was very romantic. But I was leaving for the Navy. Yes, I was in the Navy 20 years ago. I was in the Navy and um, I was leaving in two weeks. And I thought, there's no way this guy who was like captain of the football team, because in my mind, he was still the it guy. Okay. But then he wasn't the it guy anymore. Something I couldn't really see at the time. I would had just grad, graduated from high school. He was still this cute friend's older brother. And so we started to date. And as I look through all these letters, I see this guy who had found this girl with stars in her eyes about him. And we were like all lovey-dovey. I was all lovey-dovey, schmoopy-schmoopy from the get-go. And that filled him up so much. That made him feel so good about himself because I was younger. He knew me. I was all enamored. And so two weeks go by. I leave for the Navy. I'm in Great Lakes, Illinois. I'm in boot camp. And here come all those letters. Letter after letter after letter after letter. Months go by. Months go by. Six months goes by and we communicate through letters and phone calls and visits back home. And he came to visit. And by February, he was on the beach in Virginia where I was stationed proposing. I mean, it happened that fast. And in the meantime, is this boring or are you listening? Are you guys out there? Because <laughs> I, I don't know what, how you would comment on this, but um, so in months, oh yeah, in months we were engaged because it was like, we thought it was meant to be. We all knew each we knew each other our whole lives and and so I don't know, I didn't really plan on telling this whole story, but what I realized is that um thank you for saying that. You're on and off between listening and cooking. Okay, good. I'm glad this isn't boring. So I'm by the way, in the Navy, I'm surrounded by like super cute guys, but it's not distracting me because I've met the love of my life and we're writing letters and I had all these guys hitting on me, which gosh, if I could go back, I would have been like, hey, peace out. I'm going to go date like all these caught guys in the Navy, <sighs> but I didn't. I stayed devoted, hopelessly devoted to my guy in Nebraska who I was in love with. I was in love with him. Okay. Yes, I was in the Navy. And so um, I found out. I came back home. I actually got medically discharged from the Navy and I found out when I had a ring on my finger, this is in the book. I remember waking up one morning, I was at his house. He had gone to work. He, he was the, he poured concrete. He had gone to work. I woke up and I was like, I'm going to clean his whole bedroom. Cause it was just, he was such a pig. I say in the book, he was a cute pig, but he was a pig. And I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to clean, I'm going to organize, I'm going to do all the laundry, I'm going to make it all just perfect when he gets home. But then I found a letter on the dresser. And the letter was from the ex-girlfriend. Yuck, real men clean their damn room. Yeah. And his ex-girlfriend was, um... Angela. That's her real name. Who cares, right? And like you guys are going to know an Angela in Nebraska. Actually, I think she lived in Iowa. But anyway, um, I looked at the letter. Oh, you know, I read it. I'm by myself. There's a letter from the ex. I've got a ring on my finger and I'm looking at it and I'm terrified. And so I open it and, uh, it says, um, and you guys tell me if you think this should be in the book, because you guys will be the first to know. It says, um, I don't remember all of it because it was just a blur. I know, I totally, totally read it. And I would read it again because you're with somebody and there's a letter from the ex. I mean, sorry, but I'm going to read it. So most of it was a blur, but I just remember reading it was so great to make love to you three times, just like we always did. Who is this Melissa 
and what does she mean to you? And the way she read it, I could tell she had been standing exactly where I was standing at that moment because the pictures of me were in, like they were, there was like a picture frame and then there were other pictures of me shoved in that, you know, inside the picture frame. And by the way she read it, I was like, she was standing right here when she, as she was referencing the pictures of me and my heart, I still remember, like all I remember was, oh, did she have to say they had sex three times? Like, really? Did you have to? Okay. So, all right. I'm glad this is, I know it's so sick. It's like, and this is the guy who wrote all of these letters. Here they are. I still have them. Wrote all these letters. There's schmoopy pictures in here. I look at it and, you know, I don't have any romantic feeling for him now. So it was, it was just kind of interesting to read. I hadn't, I probably hadn't read those letters in years, but I kept them and I'm so glad I did. I think I kept them just for this purpose. And, and then at that moment, if you've ever been cheated on, you start going backwards. You had me at Schmoopy, right? You start going backwards and you're like, once that happens, the relationship totally ends. It really does. Like the relationship as you know it, you're reading it. You're like, you had sex with somebody else. I had, you put a ring on my finger, but then you're with your ex. So I don't know if I should tell you guys what he told me when I, um, that would be an addition to your book. It's raw, real and relatable. Okay, good. So, Hey Kara. So we're talking about my very first love that <laughs> Kara's like, what happened? Who had sex with you? No. So this was a long time ago. This was my first love. So this is like 20 years ago. Okay. So I, I will tell it. Um, it's already written. Most of it is actually already written. I'm just kind of finishing up. Actually, I'm, I'm finishing what I'm talking to you guys about right now and kind of rounding out the final piece of it because it's that piece where you're like, um, because when I talk about gumball love, people are like, well, isn't that a narcissist? And I look back at this guy, I don't know if I should say his actual name. We'll call him Joe. If I look back at him, I don't know at that time if he was necessarily a, tell what he said. Okay, this is my sister. Who knows? Um, I don't think at the time he was a narcissist. <coughs> um, hold on. I have to get a drink of water. My bottle of water is ginormous. Hold on. Okay. So um, I confronted him and I'm just... I'm just like, I remember sitting in the car. I remember um, getting, I just wanted to get home. I just wanted to get out of there. I thank God I didn't clean the whole room. I'm still glad to this day that I did it because, you know, it would be my luck to clean the whole room and then find the letter. But it was like the first thing I found. He probably was head of the football team and super popular. Yes, he was head of the football team and super popular in his day. But this was four years past his day. So he was... He was still, I think at that point, he was so good looking and had it so good in high school. And he was that it guy that when four years passed, he flunked out of college. He lost his baseball scholarship. Um, he lost a lot of the things that he depended on. He could, he would just, he could get his way just by smiling and he would say, I'll just smile and flash my blue eyes and I'll get away with it. Like if he needed something from a waitress. I mean, it was just, it was pretty amazing to watch him work. Like he could just get what he wanted just because he was so cute. And hey, Leslie. So uh, we're talking about my first love and how, uh, how he won me over. And then I've already told the story of how he cheated and how I find, found out that he cheated. So I found a letter on the dresser of his bedroom and it talked to the, it was his ex that had written him a letter and she had basically was reaching back out to him. She didn't know if he was dating anybody, but when she was leaving his bedroom early that morning after they had had sex, she noticed pictures of me and probably letters or my, the paraphernalia from our relationship. We were engaged, but she didn't know any of that. They just randomly hooked up because 
and it's funny, even in the letters that I wrote, I just read a ton of them the other night because I was trying to get in this mindset of what is what was this like in the very beginning, the very, very first time I truly fell in love and it was my first relationship. It was two years. So I dated him another year or a little more, another year after I found out about the cheating. Oh yeah, because I was engaged. We loved each other. I know, right? It's like hashtag duh. But I was only 19. Well, I know, right? Alan, you're like, dude, are you kidding? And like, right now, I would, I can't, I can't even tell you. You know, the, like the, the cartoon where they're like, Pong! and then there's just like the imprint, like you can see the, their body print in the doorway. It's like, oh, like I would have been so gone. I, right now, I'd be so gone. But, this is somebody I had known my whole life. This is like, he was my first love. I loved him so much. I was planning on marrying him. This happened to you too, but you were already married. Oh, ooh, Leslie, I don't know that part of your story. Young and dumb, been there totally. Young and dumb, totally in love. But haven't we made this decision even when we're older? Like, you know, someone's cheating. The devil wants an angel. But as I look back, well, okay, here's what he told me. <laughs> this this was funny. And I was still in the Navy when I heard this story. So I went back and told all my Navy buddies, who are still my buddies to this day. And he said, when I confronted my ex, we're calling him Joe. I don't think I've ever dated a Joe. Uh, when I confronted him, he said that his ex, Angela, used to write letters to him and predict, uh, she would predict things that were going to happen and then try to make them manifest in real life before the letter arrived. <laughs> like, because she was really into psychology. This was his, you know, this was a 22 year old guy telling or 23 year old guy telling a 19 year old girl. And I remember sitting there in the car, in this piece of crap car that he had, watching him tremble in fear because he knew I was like, I was, I wanted to leave. I, I just, I didn't believe him. And I was like, I don't believe you. And he kept telling me that story so emphatically, <laughs> Jedi mind tricks, that I just said, I believe you. And I remember he went, you do? <laughs> Like if we could see this on video, we would just be like, oh my gosh. But I just, I wanted to thank you so much. You're, I don't think you're the only dude. There are other dude fans. We have other guys, uh, other guys that watch Gumball Love because a lot of guys go through women putting them through the same thing. And so this is just casual scope talk. Um, you're a dude. Alan's here. Yes. <laughs> dude. D-O-O-D. So um, I just said, I believe you because I didn't want to break up. I didn't want it to be over. I was engaged. I loved him. We had invested all this time, but you better believe that I keep pulling. This is what I pulled out. These, this is the only paraphernalia I have. I don't even have a text message from an ex yet right now in my phone, but I have, this is the only thing I have. It's from my first love, all the letters, and, you know, if we, if we would have been, if we would have gotten married, this would be such a cool box to have, but it's not cool. And I read in those letters that, oh, Angela was reaching out to me. I don't know what she wanted, but she sounded kind of sad. That was in a couple of the letters. And I was thinking, oh, there were my clues. I don't think I'm going to keep it, Christy. I think once I'm done using it for what I need to for the parts of the book that I need it, then I'm going to let it go because... Um, at this point, it's just kind of a, it's, it's your memories. It's part of your life. It's like, even though it turned out bad, it's still my first love. There's still, there's still like, um, it's part of my story. Even when I talked to him, I don't know, three, four years ago, um, uh, he was actually, and this is where I think he has turned into the narcissist or the gumball guy because he reached out to me when he was engaged to another girl. He's married to her now, but I think they were, they were like almost getting married within 
weeks or days. And he asked me out to dinner. <laughs> this is just a few years ago. And I was like, what? Yeah. So I think as he got older, he got worse. But he, um, at the time, I feel like he was just a young guy. <laughs> That's my sister, douche, who knows him personally. Um, but anyway, the point of the story, can you tell this is a little bit hard for me to say to you, but this is a good exercise. I appreciate you guys hanging out with me because as a writer, you're sitting there at your computer. I have my laptop is right down here and you're sitting there like, do I say this? And who's going to read this? But then it's like, I think of you guys versus the people that actually know me and it doesn't, you know, most people won't know the people in these stories. It's my story to tell. They can write their own books, but perfect Friday night hangout. Yes, Chrissy. Awesome. Uh, but when you're writing, you get a little bit nervous. Uh, like Leah Remini wrote, um, thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Leah Remini just wrote a book about Scientology and Hollywood and she named everybody, Tom Cruise, um, all that stuff. So Monica Lewinsky, yeah, she, she had to come out and tell, I mean, these people told everything. And I think there's a, there's a time and a place to tell everything. You don't need to tell all of your deepest, darkest secrets, but I think like if you have a book and you're writing and that story is, I think sometimes there's a story that needs to be told and then you sit there and go, and it's usually the one you kind of don't want to tell, but and the most interesting thing about Joe, the guy that we're calling, Shep Daddy, how are you? Like this one I told the most, the craziest thing about the guy I just told you about my first, uh, I do remember you, of course I do. How is your wife? I am good. You haven't been on a scope in a long time, but I haven't been scoping as much because I've been creating and also my full-time job is, it's like back in the swing of things for the first of the year. So as my schedule kind of gets more balanced out, um, yes, it has been a while. This guy that I dated, my first love, when we were, we'd be laying in bed, we'd be ready to go to sleep, and just like on a Tuesday night, thank you so much, you too, happy new year, um, we would be like ready to go to sleep. It, let's, it would be like about right now, say it's midnight on the East Coast, about right now, and uh you, if you want to follow me, you can swipe up or swipe to the right. Uh, if you have an iOS, I think it's, I never can remember this. Is it swipe up if you have a droid and swipe to the right? You'd think, you'd think I'd know this by right. Where's Alex Pettit is in my head. Swipe up on the droid, swipe to the right on the iOS. I always get them mixed up. Swipe some direction so you can see right on the iOS. Okay. Uh, and then you just click on my name and you hit follow. So thank you so much. I'm sorry I didn't. I haven't seen all of your comments, but I try to stay focused on what I'm saying. Anyway, we'd be laying there at about this time of night. And when you're like ready for bed, you know, you don't have makeup on or you've had like all day makeup on. He would say, you guys are going to die. He would say, let's go to last call because the last call in Nebraska was 1 a.m. I need some attention. I kid you not. This is what he would say to me. Let's go to last call. I need some attention. And I was so young then. Yes, Alan, he would say those exact words. I need some attention. And you know what he needed? He wanted to go to the bar and he wanted the, everybody who was already drunk at last call, so they were at their drunkest point of the night, to see him and be like, Hey, what's going on? How are you? What up? Like he wanted that big norm, you know, from Cheers. Like that's how, this is how I've written it. This is actually the first story in my book. <laughs> yes, damn, we put it norm. Uh, and then we think I'm meeting his needs. Uh, am I meeting his needs? Yes. I, then you, qu so that's exactly what I did. I think that's what you meant, Christy. Like I were, I remember sitting there going, I am, I'm just like, I never want to go to the bar. Like, I don't want to go right now. I've just never, even when, and actually I was even too young to be going in there anyway. I wasn't even 21. But, um, hey, Jess, welcome, welcome. So we're talking, I'm talking about my first love. I'm talking about how um, I've, 
I've hesitated. I'm putting myself into my books. And people are like, Melissa, I've been writing this book forever. I've had this concept for years. But I was so afraid to put myself in the book. So right now, it's a good book, but it's pretty dry. And it needs stories. It needs more stories. It needs like the reason this whole thing got um, written. Uh, so the fact that he mentions another female hints that he's cheating. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about there. Sorry. So anyway, he would say, let's go to the bar for last call. I need some attention. And I remember, um, I remember just getting up, putting on my coat, you know, fixing my hair a little bit, whatever. It was just our hometown bar. But I remember just sitting there feeling like, why do we have to be here? Like, why do you need to come and spend 30 minutes? You said he would mention the X and those were your hints. Oh, yes. I said that a while ago. Uh, I bet you'll never forget that line. I know. That's actually the first line of the book. You guys are getting like all this first. You're getting all the exclusive. That's the first line of Gumball Love. Let's go to the bar for a last call. I need some attention. This was the first, my first love. And a person I trusted, a person I knew my whole life. And a person that had a great family. His sister was one of my best friends growing up. I trusted him implicitly. And I still think about his family. And he's, his family was great. His parents were fantastic. I loved his dad. And his dad was, his dad was actually the guy that said, I think you need to break up with my son. He, he could see that his son wasn't treating me the way he should be treating me. So, you know, when you're, the reason I say that is because we, we date these guys and I used to sit there and go, well, I wonder why he's like that. And I would analyze his dad and I'd analyze his mom and his brother and his sister. But you know, his family didn't have these issues. He had these issues. But when I look at the rest of the family, everything was pretty much intact. So that's why I titled this Too Good to Leave and Too Bad to Stay because sometimes it feels like that. And that's what I went through when I was young. I knew that he had cheated. I tried to stay because, I, you know, he was my first love. And it was just the idea of breaking up. I wasn't strong enough to do it. And I wish I would have journaled more. Um, did we actually hang out years ago? And I don't remember. Probably. Um, who knows? Were you in the Navy, Jess? I heard, I saw you make a comment. So, uh, so yeah, he would say, let's go to the bar for last call. I need some attention. And I would sit there and watch him get the adoration from his people of the past, people he played football with, baseball, family, friends, whatever. I mean, just whoever was in the hometown bar in those days. So, um, and then I would sit there and think, God, I hope no one asked him to go to an after party because then, then I'm going to have to be at some person's house until like three or four in the morning and we'd have to work the next day. And it was like, why, why is this necessary? Why do you need this? And so this is what I talk about gumball love where I could, I was ready I was giving him attention. He had attention from me, but he needed something else. Sounded like he needed that all-star attention. It, he would get a craving and he would need a boost. He wanted me to go with him, but he would need to go get that boost. And it was, he needed a different color of gumball. And so I used to, <laughs> used to have the gumballs color coded because I teach that some guys need different flavors of attention and sometimes they need them at different times. So they're perfectly okay with you there. Like he wasn't really mean to me, but he just was young enough and felt comfortable enough to say, I need attention. I want to go, I want other people to adore me. He wanted that boost. And so I just think, you know, I, and I remembered that line years after I thought of the gumball love concept and it came to me, I just like sat there and I thought, oh my gosh, this happened in 1995. I heard that line and you know, 20 years ago. So going on 21 years ago, 20, 21 and a half years ago. So the reason I'm telling you this is because my mission is to help you figure out Maybe 
Um, did he show you off on his arm or are you just there? Uh, I think there was a little bit of both. I mean, I was younger. I remember the girls in my hometown that were older than me. I didn't even really know them that well. Uh, or some that were just a couple years older than me, which is a big deal back then. Uh, they were just, they were just pissed because they all wanted to date him. So there was a lot of competition, even though I can look back and go, you know, there wasn't a lot. There, he didn't have much to offer, but still, he was he was a hot commodity. Um, he had great hair. He doesn't have any hair now, but his hair was his pride and joy. Oh my gosh, he was the. Do you ever meet guys that say how much they love their hair? It's like so gross to me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, glad I didn't end up with him because we could not be more opposite as far as what we believe in, our values. Uh, everything, politics, religion, what we think about uh, pretty much everything. We are complete opposites. And we were Facebook friends for a while. And finally I had to block him because everything he posted about was like, Ugh, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't even, it just made my skin crawl because he was just, and I thought we weren't compatible at all, but I didn't look for any of that. I didn't see any of that. The fact other people were attracted to him made him more attractive. Absolutely. I mean, I felt like I was dating the most famous guy in my town at the time. I mean, it was, it was a big deal. But at that point, we were already in love. We were already engaged. So I had a ring on my finger at that point. I mean, I thought I was going to marry him. His family was like my family. We, I had grown up with like his, go, I grew up spending the night at his house with his sister for like forever. Like he was the older brother. Like we didn't really, I didn't, I always had like the crush on him, but I never thought I would end up dating him. So then when I ended up dating him, ended up being engaged. Yeah. I think there was a lot of hype because I didn't, I didn't know any better. Right. So I had to figure it out slowly through many, many, many wrong guys. And that's why I'm here. And I'm, I'm, I turned my pain into the, um, I'm turning my pain into, there's the word for it. And I can't rem I can't think of what I'm, I'm trying to say. Um, but again, I just appreciate you guys sticking with me and, and listening to the story because I guess the whole thing is when I look back, he was, he wasn't a guy playing games with me. Thank you so much, Alan. I appreciate that. He wasn't playing games with me. Um, he may have started to do that later, but he was a guy that felt he had a very low self-esteem. Was he a narcissist back then? Not really. He was much simpler of a guy, very simple and just felt really low about himself. And I think I started to take pity on that. And there's many messages in this scope. Like when you start to feel pity, versus love. I felt sorry for him. I remember how scared he looked when I confronted him and I didn't, I didn't want him to feel sad like that. I didn't want him to, I didn't want to put him through my own punishment. So I let him free of it because I just was like, ah, okay. I, I could tell how bad he felt. And I loved him so much that I just let him off the hook, you know? So I know that so many of us, yeah, I was just going to say so many of us have been here. You've been here where you're like, you can tell uh, guys like this make you mad. I know you can tell they feel bad. You can tell. And then you're like, well, everybody makes mistakes. So should I just forgive him? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that was a thought. Everybody makes mistakes. So maybe this is just his mistake and I should just forgive him. But my hello Ryan from Seattle. So we're talking about when and, and and I'm talking about my first love. So obviously when you get older you can see things through a different lens and you can see things um much with much more mature eyes. But I guess I think we need to go back to the very beginning to understand what types of decisions we started to make about love. And this is what I hope to change for so many of you. Did I freeze? Are you guys still there? Um, am I frozen? Nope, I'm not. Okay. Um, what I hope, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Present here, roll call. 
what I hope that this can do for you is just to like take some inventory and be like, who did I fall in love with and why? And was it really love or was it schmoopy schmoopy, lovey dovey, you're so, because if I, I showed these, this, I've showed this box. If you've been on here, I've showed this, but this is, this is my first love. And this is all of the letters and all of the, this is a lot of schmoopy schmoopy. But at the time for both of us, I can tell he genuinely felt love for me in his own, in his own capacity. Okay. But was it truly a love for me of who I was inside? I think so a little bit. Uh, if he could hear me talking, he would be like, what are you saying? Of course I loved you back then. I've even asked exes in my not so distant past. And one of them said, of course I loved you. How could you not think I loved you? But I still, now that I understand love a little bit differently, and I've really looked at it and said, but, but was it really love? Because I look at my happily married friends and people that are are in my family and I look at how they are loved and I look at the men that aren't significant others that love me for who I am and it looks much different and it sounds much different and it acts much different. So although sometimes people might say, I love you, they, they may not mean, they may not mean the real thing. I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. <laughs> you had to sing. <laughs> oh, I want to know what love is. I want you to show. Boy, I haven't heard that song. That's like, that's like an 80s song, right? Uh, and yeah, we kind of needed a non-serious. I wish I just had that song on cue right now. I should Google it. But, uh, and there, there's just, too much to talk about to go in what it really looks like, but um, you weren't alive and you weren't alive in the eighties. When were you alive? When were you born? You're so cute. You weren't alive in the eighties. I was alive for all of the eighties. Only part of the seventies though. Twenty six. Well, good for you for being on this scope. So, dudes, d o o d s, dudes that are on this scope. Um, you're so old then. Jess, you are? Jess, I thought you were like a youngin. I thought you were like in your 20s. Um, I don't know. I've always just pictured a young girl in your, your picture. Uh, you too? You are youngin or <laughs> keep that profile picture if it makes you look like you're in your 20s, right? And you're not. Um, so dudes that are on here, what do you think, girls? You will be 40 this year. Okay, well, you're still young. Um, what do you think about girls that fall for this schmoopy schmoopy kind of love? Now everyone's saying their age. Yeah, if you want to say your age, I'm very curious because sometimes people are very young on these scopes and sometimes I, I'm surprised. Some people are in their teens, 45. Uh, I, I think my demographic for gumball love is probably, so Tori is 20. She's a youngin. My demographic I feel like is about 25 to 55 ish. Um, but 25 to 45 is probably, you think girls fall in love with stereotypes like movies or erotic novels. Okay. That's actually one of my second chap, my second chapter talks about this where, um, I don't use Joe, the guy that wrote me all those letters. I don't use him as that example, although I could, but I had other romances that happened after this one, when I broke up with him and finally moved on, and other relationships that were so romantic and so, like, even more schmoopy schmoopy. Like, sorry, his his game got seriously upped. Like, he had he had many competitors that outdid him after that. Cinderella and Prince Charming stereotypes give off un unreliable or unrealistic expectations. Yes. So that's the other thing where we watch romance novels, we, or we listen, we read romance novels, we watch the movies, and then we get this false 
perspective on what it should look like. As little girls, we watch those movies and expect that. Yes. And, and you can get it. I've had it. I've had like crazy romantic things happen to me. Like amazing. Like I could write movies about it. They were incredible. Like in Hawaii with a gorgeous guy who was six foot six. And I think I might still have a picture of him. I maybe I had to keep that one. I mean, it was just like, what, who, who is this guy? Unicorns. I mean, I've had unicorn experiences where it's like, you think this has to be the one. I mean, look at him and look at the, I'm in Hawaii and we're sitting in this hot tub and we're drinking pina coladas. And it's like, this has to be something. No, it can just be a hot guy in a really exotic place. And it can mean zero because he can be a complete tool in real life. But If you don't know and you go from one experience to the other and you never stop and go, wait a minute, is my perception of love a nice suit? Yes. (laughs) I even had, I met another unicorn here in New York City and he had a nice suit. Oh, he was, he was the most beautiful unicorn of all, truly. Like he had the whole package, but again, he was just a mess. He was a mess. He was 38, 37, 38 at the time. So yeah, I mean, absolutely. And it's like, you know what? Your unicorn, we all have our own version of a unicorn. How old would he be now? Uh, This was just, this was just a little over a year ago. So he's 30, eight or 39. I can't remember. There was a discrepancy of whether he was 36 or 37. So he's either 37 or he's 38. Are you the unicorn? Are you that guy? Well, if you are, you are an amazing unicorn, the most beautiful of all. Um, yeah, there was a discrepancy over his age. I feel like he lied by one year though. (laughs) <laughs> what did he do or what did his job? We don't need to get into all of the specifics. And this is the thing I don't want to do as a writer. I don't want to, I want to give enough of the, he just had an amazing job. Like he had a, he was very successful and we'll just say uh, in the corporate world and in the financial, um, in the financial area. And, uh, but it was more like he was tall and he had a great voice and he was, um, no names in the book. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to give specific names. I'll probably change all the names. I would want the names changed when you're writing this stuff. It's like, uh, if it were me and somebody was writing a perspective, I would just prefer that they changed my name to, you know, Vanessa or something. Um, my version of a male unicorn has definitely changed over the years. Yeah. And I'm telling you that, when you have had this, the gumball love experience, you're going to call me now, now I'm thinking of Lyndon and Vanessa. So I just randomly thought of it, but doesn't it just, it just sounds like a beautiful girl, which Vanessa is, if you don't know Vanessa Coleman, she is the most naturally beautiful person I think I know in real life. Um, but anyway, yeah, I would prefer that my identity was concealed just because it's not really necessary to out the person. We're not mad at them, but it's necessary to tell the story. And so that's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking tonight. If you guys are just joining, um, with age and experience comes wisdom. Yes. Um, we're talking about whether if you should stay with somebody or leave them when it's too good to leave but too bad to stay. And you're trying to make those differentiators. And I think on, I do my broadcast on Parachute TV tomorrow. If you guys are not following Parachute TV, uh, it's Parachute TV number one. I do a broadcast there every Saturday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern, 3.30 p.m. Pacific. And I think what we're going to talk about tomorrow, I think, is how when you are going through that decision, whether to break up, you kind of like how, how you weigh those pros and cons. Um, and a friend of mine's going through this right now where we were talking about it and she was saying how there are these pockets of good things, good times that give you hope. 
And then you just, you start focusing like the, the breakup can get so emotional and you're so sad because you love them so much, but, but you realize you're really only staying in the relationship because they give you these moments where they show you the person from the beginning, or they show you signs that seem like they really care, or they show you like things that make you go, oh, like it just pulls at your heart. Uh, the hottest loves have the coldest endings. Yes. And I think it's because I thought I pulled my, hang on, I just yanked this cord. Um, hope comes from trusting God. Yes. Trusting God. And, and, and ultimately when you have your trust in God and you attract the right person, you're not laboring over those types of things anymore. You're not laboring over whether this person is the right person for you or not. Um, but I think so many of us that are like, I don't know, it's not good enough to stay, but it's not bad enough to leave. It's because you're staying only for the little blips of when it's good. If she isn't totally into you, forget it. It will never work. Yes. If there is doubt, then it probably isn't a relationship you should stay in. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think there's sometimes there's doubt in a lot of relationships, but I think if you've been doubting it for a long time, um, if, I mean, I just think, you know, but I think, you know, in your gut instinct, but I think a lot of us have gone through so many bad relationships that we know, but we don't trust our decision. Yes. But wisdom comes from number one thing. Wisdom comes from number one thing to have. Yeah. Okay. Wisdom is the number one thing to have in relationships. Sorry, I keep kicking this light. Um, I think we know, do I mean self-doubt? Um, kind of, but I really didn't know how to identify. I couldn't break the relationship down. Like I look at my relationship with my ex and I look at all these letters that he wrote and I can see the puppy love. I can see that he felt things about me, but when I really look at it, it was more of how I was making him feel. He fell in love with how I made him feel because I love to edify. I remember as, as I was reading the letters, I remember like, um, if you can't talk like this with him, then leave. Like, like I'm talking to you. Yeah. I mean, that's truly, and that's, that would, that's been, I will be honest with you guys you know, when you do this, like I want to do this for a living at some point, I've got to find the guy that can deal with this. But as I, as I research it more and more, um, I was talking to a friend of mine, a couple, we were doing a Skype together as a couple. And he said, he said, Melissa, if I agreed with what you are saying, then I wouldn't care if I, he's like, I would date you if, or date a girl that if I agreed with it, then it wouldn't matter what she was saying. So, but I used to hold back uh, so many delays in getting my book out and done because I had so many doubts, like who's going to talk to, who's going to date a girl that writes about this stuff? Well, the guy that's not a gumball guy, the guy that's not going to cheat on me, the guy that's going to respect me. You know what I'm saying? Um, walking on eggshells. Yes, you do a lot of that with the wrong person because you don't know what to expect. And then when you get, I, I think you fall in love and it's, it's so good in the beginning. It's so good because my whole purpose, this is supposed to be a short scope and it ended up being longer, but, um, holding back as egotistic fear rearing its head. Yes, you're so right. It's ego. It's like, what are people going to think? And you know, you have to, I had to just go, I mean, part of me being on Periscope for almost six months was me letting go of that and going, well, it is what it is. I'm out here. I'm talking about it because helping people and, and fulfilling my life's purpose is more important to me. Uh, you need to make sure you get the respect from the first day. Yes. Thank you guys. You guys are so awesome and warm. And I mean, I can't tell you how much you being out there, just if I turn on Periscope that you guys show up, I mean, that's like, I would have been floored if someone would have told me a year ago that that was going to happen. I just would have been like, how, 
How would I get that to happen? I don't even get it. Like it wouldn't have made even one bit of sense to me. And because you don't know if your ideas are good enough, but uh, love me or hate me, it won't make me or break me. Ooh, I like that. Pensive. I like that. Pensive TM. I like that. Um, and it's so true. Like I'm reading the book Big Magic by um, Elizabeth Gilbert. That's her name, right? Eat, pray, love. Wait. Yes. I always hesitate on her name for some reason. Like, is that her? Because it sounds like Melissa Gilbert. I always think of the girl from Little House on the Prairie, which makes me sound really old. But whatever. I totally watched it. Um, but she, her book is called Big Magic, and it's talking about how you just have to, if you have something on your heart that you feel like you need to get out and share with the world, then, <laughs> thank you, at least I don't look old, uh, then you just have to do it. And if it becomes a huge success, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You just, she, she wrote Eat, Pray, Love, and she was like, I don't know if it's going to become successful. She didn't know what was going to happen. I look like a 28 year old. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, uh, if you need to share, grab a megaphone. Yes, exactly. And why is it so hard for us? I don't know. I think, uh, I think your big magic is when you get really vulnerable and it's hard, but then I was just going to say it feels better. Yes, it does feel better. It's very liberating because then all your stuff is like out there. And then it's like, well, I've already talked about it. Nothing bad happened on this scope. We had a couple trolls, but you know, the trolls are just putting in the quarter. They want the gumball. We tried not to give them any gumballs. We didn't reward them for their behavior. But yes, the truth will set you free. You're free. I always say you're free to move about the cabin. And then you can like you can, then you're out there and there's nothing that anybody can say or do to scare you anymore. There's nothing anybody has. When do, one door closed, another one open, just wait. Yes, exactly. So, um, so, so many things. I, I keep trying to do a wrap up, but I really don't think I can because we, we talked about so much. Do you guys have any other questions? Because it is getting pretty late on the East Coast, um, 1230, but it's Friday night. So hopefully you guys can sleep in tomorrow. I love Friday nights because it means I can sleep in with, no, your, if my ex, if my ex would mention a former crush, should I have been worried? If my ex would mention, if you're like, what do you mean? If your ex mentioned a former crush, because if she's your ex, then why would you worry about her mentioning a former crush? I guess I'll understand. Uh, no, nurse life. You got to be work at 6 a.m. Okay, wait, but it's only 930 for you, right? Because you're in Washington. Let's say my ex was sexually harassed by a crush. Okay, but is she being harassed if it's a crush? Wake up at 445. Christy, you have to get up. You better go to bed. You can watch the replay. Okay, but if she's mentioning this and she's an ex, why is this important to you? Wired questions. How to stay up and meal prep. Oh, good. Should I have been worried at the time? Oh, if your ex is mentioning a crush, I don't know. Where was she being sexually harassed? Like, and was it really harassment or was he just flirting? It's just like she worked with him at her professor's office. So who was the person... Flirting. I'm going to say flirting. Thank you, Omar. I appreciate that. The professor. Maybe she was trying to get a reaction from him. Yeah, sometimes when girls bring up that they were being flirted with, it's kind of like they want to see, they want attention. It's kind of a gumballing uh, tactic. Oh, so-and-so is flirting with me. Or she may have put it in the sexual harassment Um she may have put that in the sexual harassment, you know, box just to see, uh, yeah, I knew some girls that do that or make, yeah, or make it up mm -hmm. because they're just trying to get you to be jealous and it's a way to increase the intensity, get you to pursue them. So whether it was really going on or not, 
but it's just kind of, it's kind of a uh, desperate attempt to get you to be worried and then pursue or ask questions or maybe maybe he really was flirting with her and then she wants to talk about it so she wants to talk about the compliments that she was getting oh well he was saying this or he was saying that because a lot of times when people love attention they want to recall those moments where people were giving them attention so they can talk about it it's like oh let's talk about how so-and-so is giving me compliments it's like people that bring up stories that make them look good on purpose so everybody's like oh yeah let's reminisce on how you were awesome so then they they can reiterate it and talk about it again that is a gumballing that's a quarter they put in the quarter so that you give the gumball so and if they're a narcissist you can um there's a gal i can never remember her name she's at narcissistsupport.com she does tons of videos on narcissism and she says go gray rock on them like you just get totally boring to that person very fi thin fine line with harassment all depends on the recipient's reaction yes um yes you need to read about the narcs yes absolutely dana thank you yes dana at narcissist supports i love gray rock because gray rock is like it's the best thing to do with somebody gumballing you uh, even if they may or may not be a narcissist, but they might just be somebody who like prompts you to give that attention and you just, you know, uh, and future faking. That's another really good one. Like they fake that they're, you're going to have this amazing future with them so that you get all excited around them all the time. Many of us girls go through that where we meet a guy and they promise the world. They talk about the future way too early in the relationship, like in the first week or two, like I can really see myself with you. You're just so great. I haven't met anybody like you. And they start talking about you like for next year or they're like, hey, I have this thing, you know, would you go to a wedding? It's like six months from now. So they fake that they're going to be with you in the future to get your excitement about them amped up. So <laughs> show your tots, show my tots. I don't have any tater tots. I am so sorry. I'm totally out of tater tots, so they won't. Okay. <laughs> show your tots. <laughs> I you know it's like, how many scopes does a girl just like lift her top? I would just love to know like how many, how many times does that work for you? <laughs> it totally made me think of Napoleon Dynamite. Um, can I have your tots? And then he like takes them out. Oh, someone just said that. And then he takes them out of that gross zipped up pocket and his pants is so sick. Oh my gosh. I forced my sister to watch that movie and she was like, are you going to eat those tots? Tina, come get your dinner. Uh, I forced my sister to watch that movie and she was like, this is so stupid. Like, why am I watching this? I'm like, just watch it. And then she watches it and she's like, Yeah. It was stupid. I'm like, okay, now you have to watch it again and <laughs> realize why it's so funny. So finally she watched it again and she got it. And now it's like, I don't even know how many times I've watched it. I've probably way too many, but it's hilarious. If you haven't watched it, just know you have <laughs> smashed his pocket. <laughs> it's kind of one of those things where you just need to watch it so you're in the know. But you have to watch it twice and the first time you're like, WTF, dude, this is stupid. Vote for Pedro, yes. Or for Summer, right? Vote for Summer, vote for Pedro, yeah. Okay, that's my older dog barking, and she doesn't usually bark, so it means she has to go out. So I have to put on my boots. Uh, I can throw this ball right over that mountain. Uh, what, what was the, what's the uncle? Uncle Rico, yes. Okay, I don't have to look it up. All right, Alan, thank you so much for being one of my dudes. Have a great weekend, you guys. I'll be on Parachute TV. I'll probably do a little pre and post scope tomorrow for Parachute TV. But thanks for hanging out with me on a late Friday night. Let me kind of brainstorm the whole writing process. Good night, Tori. Good night, everybody. Lizzie, Pence, it was nice meeting you guys. If you were new, please come back and make sure you're following me. And if you feel like anybody could benefit, you can always share this. Even if just one person you think might benefit, you can always share it. So thank you. God bless you guys too. I appreciate that. So hello, Mexico. 
Uh, so thanks again, everyone. I hope this helped you. And if, if you had an aha moment, you can always, um, you can send me a Snapchat now. I'm on Snapchat, Melissa Ledger and the number one. I'm way too late to Snapchat. I did not get just my name, so I had to put a number one at the end. But if you want to snap me, you can snap me at, I'm, I'm very new at Snapchat, so don't expect a lot. Uh, but I'm going to try to get better and not seem like a narcissist because it's kind of like, really, does anyone care about random stuff? But Snapchat's kind of random. So anyway, enough about that. I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a great night. Sweet dreams, everybody. Bye.